Hello, welcome, and thanks for joining me. You might be able to tell I'm not in my usual location. I am traveling a bit for work this week, and even though the lighting in here is super weird, I thought I would go ahead and do a quick chat on The Snail on the Slope by Arkady and Boris Strugaski, which is the most recent book that I finished. And as usual, following this chat, I will also touch base briefly on what I am currently reading as well as chat a bit about what my plan next read is going to be. But back to The Snail on the Slope by Arkady and Boris Strugaski. So this was published back in the 1960s in the Soviet Union, in Russia, in the Soviet era. So I, when I was reading up on the publication history, it was really confusing to me because I think that the book was published in different parts. It's, so I wasn't real sure. But when I looked at the copyright page in this edition that I read, the first copyright listed for the book is 1968. This translation into English was done by Elena Bormashenko and was published in August of 2018. So this is a new translation. Elena Bormashenko also translated the uh, Roadside Picnic edition that I read a couple of years ago, and I think the uh, Chicago Review Press, who published this uh, novel, recent this edition, um, has sponsored several new translations of the Strugatsky Brothers' works, which I'm super glad that uh, new translations are coming out and these books are continuing to be available for English-speaking readers. So that's totally awesome. Yeah, so I wanted to read this because uh, this is the fourth of the Strugatsky Brothers' uh, novels that I've read. I read Roadside Picnic. I read, uh, then I read Hard to Be a God. And then uh, most recently I read Definitely Maybe. And now uh, The Snail on the Slope. So I did chats on all three of the previous Strugatsky novels that I've read. So I'll link to those chats uh, down below. So The Snail on the Slope. So what is this about? So this takes place on one world, but two very distinct parts of this world. One is called The Administration, which sits up on this high cliff this high cliff, um, and then the administration has this view of this seemingly, you know, down below, this seemingly ex limitless forest. So our main character in the administration's name is Peretz, and our main character's name in the forest, his name is Candide. So the administration sits on this cliff. It is sort of a, a just an absurd um, bureaucracy. Maybe like you think of as a, a government agency that just exists uh, with no real, just amid chaos that one side doesn't know what the other's doing. No one seems to know what's going on. Um, everyone's just sort of mindlessly doing what they think they're supposed to do. They don't ask a lot of questions. Um, it, most of the time things don't make sense to them. They just, sh you know go ahead with what they're doing. Their equipment's not working right in some cases. Um, they don't really know, you know, what they're, if they're, what they're doing has any value to anybody or not. They're just, they just keep churning it out. The director of the administration does these sort of announcements that everybody listens on their own phone and supposedly they get their individual, an individualized message whether or not that's true, you know, the reader doesn't know. Um, anyway, it's just a really confusing and sort of chaotic place. And then the administration, I mean, the forest down below is a very strange forest. So the people in the administration, by the way, I should say, Austin, supposedly they're there as to oversee the forest. Um, so the forest as far as there's like a department of eradication. There's a department of, uh, dealing with the natives or something like that. Cause there's people that native na natives, there are natives who live in this forest. So in the forest, um, Oh, I should say also Peretz in the administration really wants to go to the forest. The whole reason he asked to come to the administration was so that he could go to the forest, but he can't ever seem to get a permit. The permit's always, you know, going to be another day, another day, another day, another day. So he's never been able to get to, to the forest. Well, then in the forest, 
we meet Candide, who is originally from the administration, but his helicopter at some point in the past crashed in the forest, and he was rescued and nursed back to health by these native inhabitants of the forest, who are really childlike people. They're very simple people. They don't have a lot of intelligence, or intelligence, that's really the wrong word. Maybe that's the wrong way to say it. They don't have a lot of information about the forest. It's sort of they have a really simplistic um, explanation about things that happen in the forest. And the forest is a very strange place. So remember, we're on an alien world. So the administration people seem kind of, they're basically humans. But the people in the forest, we know, aren't quite the same as the people in the administration. So they're the natives to this forest. So... Um, the people in the forest, though, they have this very sort of childlike explanations of everything, and then they, they just tell the same stories over and over and over. They don't ask, they don't really ask any kind of like big questions, you know? They're really content with just their day-to-day -day existence, basically. But Candide, who is our person from the administration who crash-landed his helicopter into the forest years ago, has this vague idea he wants to go to the city, so he's always going to go to the city, you know, the day after tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. And then he forgets. So there's something about this forest, either either it's his, we don't really know as the reader at first, you know, if it's him like because he's been injured, or if it's just there's something in the forest that makes people forget, you know, what's going on. There is things in the forest we don't understand. There are these beings called the deadlings, which the villagers are terrified of and run from because they say that these deadlings steal women. So I'm not going to give away any spoilers. Don't worry. Um, I, I'm not going to give any way, you know, spoilers. Of the, the, the thing about this novel is some science fiction novels will do world building for you, you know. They will take you into an alien world or an alien civilization, and they will world build for you so that it orients you to where you are. It may be alien, yes, but you understand it because the, the, the way the story is constructed, you kind of have been informed of what things are. Some science fiction novels do not do this, and they just drop you into a foreign world, and then you have to kind of make sense of it yourself. This is how The Snail on the Slope is. So The Snail on the Slope does not do any world building for you. You just get dropped into the administration. You have to figure out this administration, which is really hard to do. And then, well, not hard to do, but, you know, you just have to sort of make sense of it yourself, what sense of it can be made. And then there's the forest, which is really foreign, and which you also have to try to understand through what clues you get from these native people who aren't real good about giving you any kind of really detailed or informed information. So you have to take that into account when you're trying trying to figure out what's going on. So I don't want to give away anything else about that because to me that was the intrigue of reading the story was trying to find my way through um, exactly what's going on. Now, having said that, there is an afterword by Boris Strugatsky. It's an afterword though, not a preface. So it's afterward. So I did not read the afterword before I read the novel. The afterword actually explains a bit more about what's going on in in the novel. So I will say this, because of the, the Strugatsky brothers, all their novels that I've read so far, all four of them now, <laughs> with more to come, but they are, they contain social symbolism. So it might be an alien world, but you know, what it's really telling the reader is really, you know, it's really symbolizing a world that, that the reader understands, which is, you know, us today, humans on earth. Granted, it's from the 60s, but we haven't changed that much as a species in the last 50 years. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, he explains it a bit. and I'm, So I am going to read something from the afterward. So if you don't want to hear anything from the afterward, um, then you can turn off the video. I don't think it's a spoiler because I'm not going to give away the story. I'm not going to give away what's go actually going on in the novel, but it will explain... Uh, the social symbolism of the story itself, which is sort of an abstraction. So to me, it's not a spoiler, but I wanted to give that warning anyway, just in case anybody didn't want to have any information about it at all and just drop into it completely cold. So, all right. 
Here is a quote from the afterward about what the administration is representing and what the forest is representing. So Boris Strugatsky says, what is the administration in our new symbolic conception of the universe? That's easy. It's the present. It's the present with all of its chaos, with all of its stupidity, improbability combined with shrewdness. The present where human errors and delusions meet an ossified system of habitual inhumanity. Love it. The very same present in which people are constantly thinking about the future, living for the future, shouting slogans in praise of the future, and yet at the same time they are fouling up this future, eradicating the future, doing their best to stamp out every single one of its tender shoots, trying to turn the future into a parking lot, striving to turn the forest, their future, into an English garden with carefully manicured lawns, so that the future doesn't become what it is capable of becoming, but rather what we'd like it to be today. So, yeah, the administration symbolizes the present, in all of its chaos and meaninglessness and its attempts to eradicate the future, the forest, and the forest represents the future. So I just thought that was so cool. Um, so the Stragatsky brothers strike again. So this was the fourth that I've read of their novels. Like I mentioned, I will be reading uh, more of theirs. I get a lot of comments, uh, quite, a, quite a lot of comments on my previous uh, book chats that I've done on the Stragatsky novels. And different people are always recommending other of their novels for me to read. And I'll get to each of them at some point. So stay tuned for more Stragatsky in the future. But let's chat now a bit about what I am currently reading. I am currently reading uh, The Maltese Falcon by Dashiell Hammett. This is mid-20th century American hardball detective fiction, which uh, this is only the second hardball detective fiction genre of the hardball detective fiction genre that I've actually ever read. Earlier this year, I read The Big Sleep by Raymond Chandler, and then this is the first of the Dashiell Hammett novels that I've ever read. Read and I'm about halfway through this, so I will get a chat up on this fairly soon when I get it finished. But it, um, and I'll explain a bit more about it in a in a moment or, or in the chat. But uh, the 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 gist of the story is basically our dete a private detective Sam Spade on the search for the Maltese Falcon. So more to come in the chat when I finish uh, get that finished, which should be fairly soon. Then my plan next read is going to be Chasing Zeus. A Journey Through Greece in the Footsteps of a God by Tom Stone. This is a work of nonfiction, and it is part, tra from what I understand, it's part travel, uh, a travel log, part memoir, and part myth, uh, part history you know, of myth, of all about Zeus and um, sort of his story in Greece. So I think Tom Stone and his wife traverse Greece and go to the different places where Zeus has different things uh, occur to him. Uh, or with him, or concerning him, and so we get we get not only um, a narrative about Greece itself, but also about the myth, uh, you know, about Zeus. So I'm looking forward to this a lot. I've had this on my reading list for quite some time, and it was on my 2018 priority reading list for um, foundational myths. So I'm getting another one of my 2018 uh, priority reads out of the way. So until next time, take care.